Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you might be. Thanks for making us part of your Wednesday volleyball coaches out there. We're super excited to bring you this episode of GMS Live. Wherever you're watching, thank you for investing in your coaching and in your programs to uh, to become better as a coach. And uh, our goal over the next hour is to help you do just that with the gentleman you see on your screen. We'll get to John and Nick. You see him at the bottom of your screen right there in just a minute. But Mike, first, I have a fun little announcement. We started doing these live shows in 2019. We did a couple in 2019. We did a couple in 2020. And then we really started ramping them up in 2022. This is our 50th live show, our 50th GMS live show. And uh, there's no one better to do it with than John and Nick at the bottom of your screen um, coming off of 2023 NCAA Men's Volleyball National Championship. Now, most of those live shows have been inside GMS Plus. And so uh, if you have watched some of our shows on YouTube, but want to see what those other 50 live shows look like, you can start a GMS Plus trial and have access to these uh, live shows, some question and answer sessions with uh, with members of our, our, our advisory staff. You can go ahead and uh, start a trial a gms plus trial uh for free and uh, and check all that out and um just a wealth of knowledge inside of that live show database that we've gathered together over the last couple years and we're going to add to that uh with john spra we'll get to him and uh and nick vogel coaches at ucla john nick thanks for making us uh thanks also for making us part of your wednesday coming off the of practice and getting ready for 2024 yeah, well, thanks, Dave. Pleasure to be here. Good to see Mike. And for the fiftieth uh, show here, I don't know, maybe a free T-shirt, Mike. What do you, what do you get? What do you get for that? I'll get you anything you want, Johnny. Anything you want. <laughs> we do have some really, really nice new. Oh gosh, if I knew okay. there was a Stanley in there, I should have asked for that. That I knew. Okay. I knew. I knew either girlfriends or wives would appreciate it. We do have. Yeah. Them. John, you can win a Stanley if you hop onto YouTube real quick and type GMS Plus in the comment. You can send us a question. You can send us a comment. Just hashtag GMS Plus at the end of the show. We'll do a drawing. But John, we can send you a T-shirt also, and uh, just tell us your enough. size. He doesn't have enough. Swag. He doesn't have enough. He needs more. Yeah, I've got I've got enough tees. But thanks. All good. Speaking of T-shirts, if you all want a T-shirt out there, come join us at one of our 2024 clinics. Uh, we'll give you a. a Clinic manual will give you a t-shirt and you'll get to hang out with people like Mike and Chris, Courtney, uh, members of our staff that uh, that will be presenting at these clinics throughout the summer and throughout the spring. Go ahead and check out goldmedalsquared.com for some info on that. Um, speaking of clinics, at our clinics, we talk about what we call the 2% rule. And John, I'll let you weigh in on this as we look at your side out percentages and your opponent's side out percentages over the last several years. And uh, we talk at our clinics about how important, you know, maybe a 2% difference makes and then another 2% after that. And as we look at your jump from 2022 to 2023, you, you doubled your, your, uh, your output from 2022, outscoring your opponents by 13% this year. Is there one thing that you can pinpoint 
uh, helped make that jump from 2022 to 2023, other than Nick joining your staff? Because that was yeah. his first year. I mean, maybe Nick's responsible for this, but but how do you interpret this and kind of what were some of the differences from this year to some of these previous years? Uh, well, I I know it'd be nice and clean to say there was one thing. I, it definitely was multivariable. Um, what's most remarkable to me on the offensive side is that we did this primarily with a, a true freshman setter. I think that's that's really something really unique about this group. Um, but we just had really I think if you look through that list, um, we had a, a really exceptional libero come in in Troy Gooch, who's a graduate transfer. He had a tremendous impact on our ability to pass the ball. I think we had the continued maturity, Alex Knight and Ethan Champlin. So our, in general, our first touch was really good. And then we had an exceptional freshman setter. So our first two touches were great. I think that's probably it. In terms of defense, I don't know that there was one thing. It wasn't like we went into that year and we were like, okay, this year we're going to be all about blocking. We're going to focus on blocking. I think it was a about a comprehensive defensive system. And obviously that resonated. You see a 2% increase there too. So um, yeah, I think it was multivariable. The guys were great. I mean, the most remarkable thing on this whole chart is, is 31 and two. Cause I think anytime you're in an academic setting, it's really hard to be consistent over the season. And a lot of it just has to do with life off the volleyball court. It has to do with midterms and all the things that go on. It's, it's hard to be that consistent over, an entire season and it it wasn't like we got to 30 wins because we had some some great phenomenally talented player we had great physically talented players but it wasn't like we had some stick that we relied on who was unbelievable that we set every ball to sometimes it was ito sometimes it was champ a lot of times it was merrick in the middle uh so it was a complete team effort and that consistency i just that to me that's the most remarkable for me is i've been doing this now 20 21 22 years something like that and uh I've never had 30 wins. And so for me, it, you get to the end of that campaign and look down and see that, that, that to me is the most remarkable stat. Well, and it was the most wins that UCLA's had since 1995, correct? Yeah. And that just showed, that's when I had hair and was siding out for the Bruins. So that, that's, <laughs> and Dave, that's a long time ago. Hey, you and Mark Knudsen, I mean, my boy, Mark Knudsen, that was probably your squad, huh? <laughs> yeah, he, he was the assistant at that point because he'd already graduated. But yeah, great, great group of guys. Great team. Um, I I asked some of our GMS Plus users to send in some questions a few days ago. One of them I can throw up right now because you mentioned it. Were you more involved with setting this season than you have been in previous years, given with the first year setter? Yeah, good question. Uh, no, I think we also hired Brandon Talaferro, who has a lot of experience specifically at setter. I found over the years, it'd be really in an ideal world, it'd be great to have an assistant coach that's a former setter and can really focus in that area. They're not all that common. And so um, it's not like a quarterback coach in football. It's hard to find really setter focused, high quality coaches. And, and we were fortunate to get Brandon. And so that really helped quite a bit. I, I find myself to be more of a, a systems coach. Mike knows this really well. I'm a very disciplined offensive systems guy that's just kind of how i've developed over the years and uh to have someone like brandon come in and really have his first eye is on the technical aspects of setting and i think we combine that conversation around distribution probably was a, a pretty good one-two punch for a freshman setter okay you mentioned your uh your first two contacts and we'll get right into it um if you're watching out there over the next uh, 52 minutes, we'll talk about all of these and show some video and get uh, Nick's and John's thought about uh, UCLA's passing, offense, blocking, digging, serving. John, you mentioned the first couple contacts. We're, we're going to start with your passing, and I pulled up all these stats. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious to interpret this and see how you interpret it, because when we look at three-point average, four-point average, kind of the, the popular um, passing stats, kind of middle of the pack in the conference and amongst uh, other teams that were ranked in the top 15. But the number that stands out to me here is your aced percentage. You were the least aced team in the country, despite kind of a, a just maybe a, an average uh, passing average. Mm -hmm. Can you coach not getting aced? And, yeah. and what leads to this stat least aces? Uh, well, I, this is what I've learned and this is, this is after the year has ended and you kind of start picking the brains of your players and having side conversations in casual ways. 
one thing that Troy Gooch really brought, which I didn't really understand until much later, is such the ability to, to really have high quality communication. He was really, really good, apparently, because these are things that go on that we can't hear as coaches. It's that communication between players. And then you start talking to Alex and Champ, and they're like, wow, what a dramatic difference that was in terms of how Gooch organized and how um, how he just really talked about scene management. And you get this, and I'll take the cut here. And he was just really apparently exceptional at that, exceptional. So I think we had a really good organization with some really good, I think, pretty intellectual players. I think Champlin and Knight and, and him, they got three guys back there that think the game really, really well. And first ball side out percentage 49.9 or 45.9 percent, also best in the country. Uh, just as we watch some passing, Nick, if you want to kind of talk us through um, this first contact, keys, how you're training it, uh, what what you're looking for with good passes. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, just echoing what John said about Gooch coming in, he was a variable for this passing lineup. He was the newest person to add to some consistency that Champ and Knight had developed over years prior. And not only was his con communication incredibly high level, simple, concise to the point, but he was really consistent with his movements. He was never an unpredictable player to play next to. And so I think passers that are also worried about attacking and blocking and doing all these other things, they had the ability to just know where Gooch was going to be. And he communicated that well. He was consistent with how he moved. So just as we're watching this, what I, I love seeing and what really echoed in the stats is that not all of these passes are perfect, perfect right on top of the setter's head, but our ability to, to take that contact from the three meter line, set a really hittable ball to some <laughs> exceptional attackers on the pins, allowed us to continue to side out, even though those numbers you mentioned, the perfect pass, the good pass percentage were middle of the pack. We get this question a lot, in, especially when we're talking about men's volleyball, hand passing versus forearm passing. Nick, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think it, it can depend on the player and the situation. We noticed uh, throughout the year, people were targeting different things on our passers. Sometimes it was direct float serve. Sometimes it was cross. And that could be a, a server's preference versus what they, they think that they're trying to target on our side of the net. Um, for us, the consistency of communication comes right back into play. If somebody's incredibly comfortable in a certain situation taking that ball with their hands just making sure that that passing lineup as a whole understands where they're about to move how they're about to move around that was the best pass in my opinion i don't know if you can go back this, i, I yeah. just you talked about c management and you got both guys that went here a, a few of these passes have been yeah okay we'll we'll focus on this one see how they both go uh, there's no ambiguity somebody's passing that ball and i can tell johnny you guys are putting an emphasis on finishing that move. I mean, you guys are holding the platform for a couple of seconds. It seems like yeah. that's a priority. And yeah. And uh, these guys, is, these guys, the platforms are dialed in and, and, yeah. and, and I think it's been in my head. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Is, you know, you might've been middle of the pack with passing throughout over the course of the entire season. But if I recall during the final four, you guys were lights out. I mean, yeah. I was watching you guys, uh, those matches. And that was the first thing that came to mind was you guys are dialed in on passing. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what the numbers say, but it certainly seemed to me like you were much better than middle of the pack come, come crunch time. Yeah. Well, and something that echoed as I've chatted with players from other teams after these matches is just kind of the relentless pressure that came from our side. There were points, Mike, like you're mentioning in the final four, specifically in the Hawaii match, I remember one ripped serve down the left sideline and Alex Knight goes diving out dimes a pass and we side out immediately and it's exhausting for a team to put all that effort in to make an exceptional serve and to have the result be just the same um, and so I, again the consistency just allowed us to keep pressure on teams throughout not just the course of a match but an entire season yeah okay if any of you out there watching have questions for John or Nick go ahead and Type them into the chat section there on YouTube or Facebook, and we'll be sure to uh, to pass them over. So uh, we have the pass, we have the set, and now let's look at some offense. And uh, these offensive numbers, I mean, they're they're pretty staggering as I've as I've been prepping for this show. Um, you look at your conference rank; it, it's just first, 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 all the way down the line. And then uh, 
I pulled the stats of the top 15 teams, one through 15, and it's same thing, first, 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 kind of all the way down the line, or at least in the top couple. Um, John, what's the offensive philosophy uh, in terms of of how are you using the players and the distribution? And as you're talking about this, I'll throw this one up. Uh, here's your set distribution throughout your postseason. So the two MPSF tournament matches, the two NCAA tournament matches. That's going to be a hard defense to defend, right? You're 35% left side, and then when you add the middle front and middle back, you're another 30%, uh, and then your right side attacks another 33% of your distribution. Uh, the kill numbers look the same. This is where your kills came from. So mm -hmm. how important is this kind of equal distribution across the court, and what's the philosophy there? Uh, that that can vary. I don't think that there's one particular philosophy, Dave. I think it depends a little bit on your personnel. And so there's been years in the past and, and championship years where this may not look quite as even, where you're going to your better hitters when you have opportunities. I think here the, the real – I think what you're seeing right now in the NC2A is if you have a good opposite, you can go pretty far. Like there are not that many of them. We're not, for whatever reason, in the United States, we don't have a lot. And that, maybe that's true internationally too. Even if you look at some of the other countries in the world, they have, they're have they doing the same thing we are, which is taking an outside hitter and putting them in opposite. Um, and that's how we've survived with Maddie all, all these years. And so we have Ito. He's a big hammer and he can play fast. And we have a setter that's really, really good overhead. So I think that, that changes a lot. I mean, I, I think if I look at this, we weren't great at BIC. You know, I think that's something we can improve on this year. Uh, obviously, we we emphasize that um, on most of the teams I coach, but it's personnel based too. So this even distribution is nice when you have it. And of course, right there in that photo, you got Merrick, who is just such a uniquely physically talented individual. And so he he puts a lot of pressure on teams. I think another part of these numbers that stand out, this and the entire season graphic that you had up earlier, is that they are relatively even over the course of multiple matches and seasons. But we have the benefit of having great players in every position. And so on one night, it might be 55% left side because Ito's struggling a little bit or it's not connecting in the middle as well. And so I think that's part of what contributes to a 30-plus win season is that it's not one person and we live or die by that one person. We have the ability to chase the hot hand and spread it around and try different things in order to keep that consistency across the board. Nick, John mentioned the importance of opposite, and we'll we'll show some right side attacking in just a minute. But you've coached a lot of women's volleyball, um, collegiately women's volleyball. How important is the opposite, not just in men's, but it's moving that way more in the women's game also? And and uh, a lot of the coaches watching this show or girls volleyball coaches or women's volleyball coaches how can how can we as girls volleyball coaches uh emphasize the importance of a right side attack and kind of move towards this direction yeah well and uh, the way you phrased it there in the end really is kind of where i was going the right side attack in general whether it's opposite or middle sliding out just the ability to spread blockers a little bit more thin you can see how certain teams that don't have a right side presence, that court gets very small and suddenly you have four or six blockers hands in a very small space without them having to do very much work at all. Um, you know, certain teams definitely come up, come to mind when it comes to thinking about really physical right side attackers from the back row, which has always been uh, a little bit less present in the women's game. But again, just the, the creativity, the ability to spread people wider, you'll see some setter front row rotations where that middle just steps to the right and you have a double pin attack with a, some sort of a quick middle coming up from the back row. Um, yeah, that, that, spreading that offense and right side attack is incredibly important and it can come in a lot of different ways. John, Mike and I were watching some of these clips yesterday and and your, op your opposite here kind of starts off the court, taking a big wide, wide angled approach on a lot of these examples as approach to as opposed to a more straight on approach for a right-handed attacker uh what do you see in there or liking there how can how can i if i'm coaching an opposite what approach uh option should i choose and how do i know which is the best for the given athlete yeah i, I think um that's i think a really good question because there's a lot of coaches that feel pretty dogmatic about one way or the other and i think i've gotten less so as i've gotten 
older. And the reason being is I think I've seen so many do different, similarly players do different things well. For example, I think traditionally they're coming right down the sideline or, or close to it in some fashion. There's some like Sokolov for Bulgaria, who's an inside out guy. <laughs> you know, he's, he's coming way inside and he's coming outside. <laughs> I see some other players do that. And some players or some coaches feel pretty strongly that that's the way to do it. And then you watch Wallace from Brazil or Mahmoudi from Iran and they're, they're wide like Ito, you know? And so for me, it was just trying to, trying to experiment a little bit to figure out what was best for Ito. And once we figured out what that was, just let him do that. And so to me, that's where I'm at with that, particularly on the right side. Yeah. He's wide like that. And then what you also have is you have a setter in Rowan. That's really has a pretty unique ability to go fast overhead. I mean, that's a, there's not a lot of setters that can play his tempo overhead. So the fact that we have a player that can hit with speed and a setter that can set it, and they've figured out that connection, I mean, it puts a lot of pressure when you're going that fast overhead. I mean, look at what they have to do. They they have to go back on that one. They have to load up early. He, he's he got a hammer. So they're going to watch number nine right there. He's going to be gone because he has to. Look how early he's leaving. He's And we're going fast enough. He's got to commit that foot before he really knows where the ball is going to end up. And this ball ends up a little bit dying and he's got no shot, right? And it's not even like we plan to have that ball die. There's just variability there. And ito has got the ability to close into the court on it. What's the window you're aiming for here? Uh, for your setter, wherever, how? F- wherever Ito wants it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, on the right, on this type of system, I mean, uh, inside is probably, we're not going all the way. A lot of these, if you see, they're not going all the way to the pin. Uh-huh. Most of these. So they probably have coordinated over the season to just find a spot where they like it and they feel it opens up the most range for him. But they're, they're mostly inside here, right? They're mostly inside that pin, which is really, I think we know more about the numbers on the left side there, which is you really want that ball inside the pin. See, that's right to the pin. Good shot. Yeah. Yep. Okay, let's watch some middle. Uh, you, you mentioned middle. So now you've got left side blockers committing on your opposite or the D ball. It's going to open up a lot of middle opportunities here. So we're going to see yeah. uh, we're going to see some gaps. We're going to see some front ones, some back ones, uh, some slower tempo, some faster tempo. Uh, Nick, what do you like to see from middle offense? How do you like to establish it? and kind of get it going and how that affects the rest of the offense. Yeah, well, initially we like to see a little bit of speed coming out of that spot, which is something that we worked on throughout the course of the year, even towards the end of the year, last match of the year. That's something that we were still working on. Um, having somebody like Merrick is is a pretty nice tool to have in your toolbox because you know he's going to garner a lot of attention from blockers and defenders. Um, and that being said, there are times where it, doesn't matter whether there's two or one or no blockers, Merrick's going to do what Merrick does. Um, that being said, not all of us have a, a Merrick on our team and we won't forever. Um, and so the ability to establish quick routes into different parts of the court early on, incredibly important, whether that's front row or back row. Um, and again, if we can get to the point of establishing a fast right side attack, you're forcing three blockers to choose something on four attackers. And that's the ultimate goal. I think the big yeah, thing here is just you're on a you're, he's on it looks like he's on almost on his four steps so we call it three and a half is that yeah that it's a, it's an interesting topic Mike because what we're running here a lot with Merrick because he has the ability to do it is a lot of these drift routes so a lot of these successful swings he's had he's running pop you know a distance away from the area four commit and it's really hard to line up like that's a pop. So he he's running most of these clips are pop. And so, oh yeah, here's JR. Um, and then he audibles to a gap right there. So most of these are these drift routes. We've been spending a lot of time trying to understand that's a pop. And it, what you're seeing though is that on these drift routes, it's it's a little bit slower because he's closing and jumping to a spot straight up or or towards the setter. So that's a you know, what you call, I guess, a quarter step slower uh, and versus more of a traditional front one or speed quick attack. Um, this is a little slower. All these are, are all pops. Um, 
Can you can you um, describe a pop for our viewers? Real yeah. Quick? So we're seeing this internationally too. So we started doing it at Team USA about five years ago, where you're coming in at an angle about six feet from the setter, and then you're either going straight up on that um, spot, which is what Merrick's doing right here, and, and you can tell because you can also tell what the outside hitter's running. He's running a grind on the inside, although I don't really like the way he's running it, but. It, I'll, I'll talk to him about that tomorrow. Um, so, uh, but, but you go at six feet and you either jump towards the setter or go straight up. And so the, the opposing middle blocker has a really hard time figuring out where to set up. See, this is a pop right here. You can just tell where the outside is and where Merrick's coming in. I just know Merrick. Now, one, and then it's see how they can't line them up. See that? I mean, I have no idea where to go and they end up, they're trying to line them up on that spot. A traditional angle and he's just not there yeah forget it you're not you're not defending <laughs> that and so yeah there's another one look at them they have no idea so not only do they have to guess where the setter is going to set it but then they ought to make a decision about where is the middle going to go see how he's jumping he's got no chance so those drift routes here's the deal with the drift routes you got to have a real special attacker a real special <laughs> setter and you've got to commit a ton of time because it's a very technical route. There's a lot of complications to that. And so even on the national team, when you don't have a whole lot of time, there's this, I think every coach, one of the big decisions you have, we have a few, but is how to prioritize your time. And so um, do you want to commit that much time to establishing a system that that's complex? That's JR. So JR is a little bit more straight up. He's going to come in and just go straight up. That's just a straight up gap. It's actually a, a little wide. Sometimes you run those specifically a little wide. And that's a really nice wide. Now, JR came off the bench and he was unbelievable in the NC2A final, particularly from the service line. But JR was so powerful. You know, he was running, he was running those tempo sets or the slower tempo stuff, even when he wasn't running drift, you know, <laughs> just set him. And he was yachting balls. Yep. Now, um, where have you landed? Let's talk briefly about the simplicity of running the BIC behind more of a traditional quick like that yep. um, versus if you're going to drift. Because I think people, like, let's think this through a little bit before you run into the gym tomorrow and start teaching your 14-year-old drift routes, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> It gets a little harder, right? It gets a little harder. You got to work on it a bunch, like you said. Okay, so go back to this one. So this is a float. So he's coming. You can see the right foot down and left foot's not even down yet on a drift package. Okay, but he's about six feet away. And this time he's going to jump towards the center, but they're double committing on him. And he actually drifts past the guy that's committing in area four. It's very, it's, I, I agree with you 100%, Mike. If I was coaching 14-year-olds and I was going to the gym tomorrow, it would be the absolute last thing I'd be thinking about. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I really, I'm really, it's super effective. It requires almost an entire commitment of a system conversation. You don't have almost time for anything else. And I think and, and what you see is interesting enough is on the national team, you come back and you have that same issue, you have that same issue, maybe even more significantly on the national team, because you really don't have much time to coordinate and offensive connection and all that. You come back. Sometimes the top guys are in the gym or are there for, for less than 10 days before you've got to go compete. Like, are you going to spend all 10 days trying to coordinate the system? It's been a big debate. That's a float. So it's uh it is it is effective. And here's JR. See, he's late, doesn't matter, he's got a huge arm senior could deadlift both dave and mike and nick <laughs> and myself so, i mean just a beast so i i uh you know there's there's individual discrepancies here or differences here based on guys yeah he went off okay mike mentioned the bic uh so oh yeah i didn't answer that sorry I, talking I got with stuck watching video as john sparrow with oh. notes Gonna make some phone calls to guys on the way back. You know. <laughs> the big is it is that's the other complication so, of the drift route, Mike, is you really don't know where everybody is all the time. And so it's like, how do you coordinate that behind? And that's that's a downside to the drift package. Um this is easier. You run a straight gap, you run a bick inside of it, super simple. 
And JR likes this wide. And there it is. So you just run right down the middle of it. A lot of different philosophies here. All of them can be effective. Do you run inside of a gap? Are you mostly a gap team? Here's a big behind a front one. Your decision making zone right in there. Do you want to go back in front or behind? Right into that zone is right where that decision needs to be made. It just needs to be made definitively. I think that's the most important thing is when you're communicating in that spot right there. That spot right there, you gotta, you could go either way. You just gotta let your setter know what you're doing. Another half step forward, you probably for sure go behind. So, Johnny, you know, thanks to all the work you're doing in the men's game, um, you know, we're getting more and more questions about the men's game, more and more requests about the men's game. And, um, and the BIC is, of course, a lot of uh, women's coaches that are taking over high school programs and trying to learn how to do this stuff. Um, you know, we had a clinic this weekend in Scottsdale. We had almost 20 men's coaches there. Mm, and right. um, and so a lot of them had big questions. And I, and I said, hey, we're doing this show with John. I'm going to let him describe some of the spacing. So, um, Dave, if you could if you could kind of back up a little bit here, I'd like John just to take us through um, some of the traditional spacing, big quick, mm -hmm. like traditional big quick and spacing uh with middle and back row attacker and then um just kind of go through each one and, and johnny if you could walk through all that that'd be helpful and if if you have any keys specific keys as it relates to the spacing i think that would be helpful okay um let's see you want to go back to it so this one's a little different this is a, a medium i mean this is a nice play if you if you can figure out to be connected enough to set bick on a medium pass coming into that zone this is a pretty advanced play right here this would not be something you'd see very often. That's a, that's a really nice play. Um, but running a gap with a 40, that's a 40 going behind. You know, that's certainly an option. A lot of teams do that more. They get that, they try to get the middle to move and then go behind it. Let's watch what we got here. Okay, so this is, this is actually a float BIC. So if, you're, if your middle is jumping in, you can run more of a traditionally spaced BIC, which is what this is. So Champ is coming right, kind of almost from where JR jumped. You can kind of see where JR jumped is kind of where, um, see that? He's almost yep. right where JR started is where Champ is aiming. And JR jumps out of the way. So that's how you would run a big behind a float, that drift route where you're jumping towards the setter. So he, you actually want your big hitter right here to be, I mean, he's moving away from the setter. Yeah. And that's by design, or do you, would you rather him come in a little straighter in there? No, that's that's I think that looks pretty good. I mean, it wasn't perfectly connected, but that's the other thing too, is it's not always perfect with the BIC. I mean, it is so tightly the connection there is so tight. Um well, in that respect, actually, champ could have been a, a touch too wide. Yeah. And yeah. Dave, if you can go back to right at the point of JR the middle taking off off the ground, this is just the the specificity that has to be really clearly defined because this right here could be real bad if it's not done right. So if this were a pop route and JR were to stop his momentum and jump and land in line with number nine, who's blocking, now you've got a big that's coming and landing right on the ankles of somebody who's who's popping into that zone. So one thing that we really emphasize a lot and we get on people for is if middle blockers don't have accurate body control, we're not doing any of this. You do one or two of them, if they're showing that they can't do it, then we got to separate that variable. We got to iron out that body control and then we can introduce these other variables around it. JR has been doing that for six years at that point and is pretty well controlled. And so even though they're taking off in line, there's an understanding that there's going to be a bit of a split by the time contact is happening. And we're talking about differences when we're watching video or we're in practice. We're talking about differences of three, four, five inches that are, hey, that's not acceptable. So it's pretty fine lines. So you got a, you've got, got a big running inside a gap. Yeah. And he seems maybe a touch wide. Or are you good with this? You know, it, it's it is a touch wide. But if you look at the actual space between, let me see here, maybe a touch wide, right? I mean, e equidistant is kind of what you would traditionally see here, right? Okay. But the I, I don't know. As I'm looking at the distance between the setter and the outside, it's not off by very much. It's just that middle is kind of running right to left in transition right there. He's not maybe as wide as he normally would. These are some of the margins that are real, real slight. And and it can work, right? I mean, the guys are athletic enough to make an adjustment and get there. 
But That's standard, good. if you're running a BIC inside a gap, equidistance could be a generic answer for someone who's trying to sort this stuff out. Yeah, I think equidistant is, is not only a standard answer for BIC inside of a gap. I think it's also for BIC, around BIC, the one. BIC over front one. So where you see the distance between the setter and the middle and the middle and the middle and the outside hitter, that is also equidistant. So it, it, that phrase or those cues right there are valuable for both. So uh, you want, if I were to draw these lines, you want these yellow lines to be the same length, no, the, the same distance? Way. No, the other way. So like in between the setter and the outside hitter. Back row okay, outside. so one big hitter. line. Nope. 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 Back <laughs> That's why we're doing this. Oh, the back or outside hitter. There. From there to there. Okay. And then from the outside hitter to the middle. From this outside hitter yeah. to the middle. Yeah. And that's okay. what Mike was talking about because it's really on this where it's paused right now, we're really not there. Right. And Dave, do you have a can you go can you find a traditional front one BIC for us real quick, just so we can highlight the equidistance of that one also? Yeah. Yep, or lack thereof. Uh... Yeah, or lack thereof. Yeah, that's just. Yeah, that's just. That's two two players that have played together for a little bit and just kind of figured out where to go when it was in transition without even a middle. Yeah, that's there's better. a gap. That's nice. See, this is even a little. This is even a little different than me, for me, Mike. Right, because that gap is a position on the net, and so this is a little bit off the net and. I don't know, maybe a touch right. And so, but your bit guy is pretty consistent. They get pretty good at being a consistent distance from the setter, or they should be. Yeah. And so right, what you're seeing right now is the distance between the setter and Alex Knight and Alex Knight and the middle who's at a spot on the net. That's not equidistant there either, but that, that one is okay. That's, I think, quite well run. Yeah. Yeah, and then you got the back one. Bic. Not to get too complicated, but you can also run some balls that are a little pushed out a little bit more. Sometimes we call that a flare, almost like a, an old 30. That was a position on a court. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a little bit more back one flare, which we, the guys liked. Here's going to be another gap. Yeah. Yeah. That looks pretty good. It sure does. John, the first example we talked about, or you you said the the big hitter could go in front of the setter or behind. Is he just is he just yelling out front or yeah. behind? Yeah. Just a one yes. word to let the setter know where he's at. Yeah, front, front, back, back, something. I don't know. Big, big, maybe back. So, so that's nice. Okay, I want to show oh. these real quick because uh you're your setter doesn't hit a lot. It was 3% of your offense. If we look at that graph we showed a few minutes ago, but 700 hitting percentage in your postseason. When do you like him to do it? When do you not like him to do it? Uh, is he just, can he do it kind of whenever he wants? Um, if he's hitting and, 700, he can do it whenever he wants. <laughs> I should have done it more. I like it when he, he would hit 700, Dave. I mean, if he doesn't, it's not a good play. No, I, This is a fun sequence right here. He got a kill against Long Beach State here. Three consecutive plays. So we're going to fast forward to the next rally. And you're going to get a transition ball. He's going to get another kill. Then he's going to finish the, the sequence with the third kill. Um, but uh, it, in the men's game, is the right move just the left-handed, the left-handed setter spike from uh, maybe on a tight pass yeah let's see i, I want to see this oh yeah. this is his right hand actually <laughs> i mean honestly that may be the only time that worked the entire season so i don't i don't want to get too fired up about the swing on two <laughs> i bet you i bet you of that 700 all of them were left-handed except for that one anytime yeah. he tried to turn and just screamed at everybody that he was hitting the ball that that usually was a little less effective He's going to disagree with me. If he was here, he'd be saying those were the best swings ever. <laughs> <laughs> he he, uh, he played outside hitter in high school a lot. And so uh, he, he likes to take, like all setters, they like to take their opportunity to take a cut at the ball. Can't blame him. Nah, nah. But uh, Dave, to answer your question is uh, the dump, if you have somebody that's really good at it, really changes things a lot. Forces those 
left front and even the middle front blockers to spend a little visual time just wondering how much doubt it doesn't have to be a lot of dumps to get them to just think about it a little bit more and i i, I love it I, I mean if we could do it more i would do it more yeah i would say scouting if you're any college coaches out here maybe higher level high school juniors and, and you have the ability to scout your opponents scouting scouting teams that have an active setter is a pain in the butt it's pain and uh it's just one more thing you have to worry about it's distracting and uh, so, yeah, I, just for that reason alone, you know, it's uh, it's a hassle. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got five you got five attackers here, and only three blockers right. to try to figure out what to do against five attackers: the outside hitter, the bick that we just watched, the middle attack that we just watched was so effective. Now the setter dump gets thrown into it, and the opposite. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a fun play for sure. Um, John, let's talk about. Um, Let's talk about some serving and throw up some serving stats. A couple, a couple stats that I'm gonna uh, throw your way, and we'll uh, see if they do. It. I'm shocked that we're having this conversation, Dave. Shocked. <laughs> uh, ace percentage number one in the yep. conference, air percentage highest in the conference, and then you look at uh, national stats. Ace percentage number two, and air percentage fourteenth uh, out of fifteen. Um, the the t the team that had a higher ace percentage was Penn State. They were also the only team that had a higher error percentage. But then we look at all these other stats. First, 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 first. So we hear it all the time. Are we missing too many serves, or what? What? How many should we be missing? And I'm sure you're asked that a lot. How do you answer it? I'll tell you how I answer it because I think uh, I've been pretty vocal about two things but i think one only resonates with most of the people that remember what i said <laughs> and that is one is it's the men's game today and it's um it really doesn't i, I hesitate to say it like this because everyone just like that's all they remember but it, it doesn't it doesn't correlate with winning and losing it doesn't and so what correlates with winning and losing is getting putting pressure on your opponent now the second thing i always say too is that I, i'm not necessarily selling it like i don't think that's a great thing for our game um i've invested a lot of time and money into trying to grow our sport and what i what we really need to be doing is engaging the casual fan and and not just the casual fan i mean how many coaches are listening right now that just it it makes their skin crawl that i i would you know to look at that stat and see that we were dead last <laughs> in an error percentage and won a national championship um and listen i i I empathize with those coaches where that bothers them. Um, I can't say that it doesn't bother me when we have a crummy error or miss three in a row or whatever the case may be. It bothers me. I just have to put it somewhere else in my brain because I, I know that if I like make them hesitant and they serve the ball in but easy, we're going to lose too. So it's just this acceptance of what we have to do to win in today's environment. Um, I think last season – there were there were three really good teams at the end. I mean, Penn State went five with Hawaii. I think Hawaii was outstanding. I think we were playing good ball. And if two of those three were 14 and 15 in the country, you know, that in service errors, it shows you where the game is. And I, I don't agree with it. Like Mike and I've talked about this before. Like we should be changing the rules. We should be coming up with some ways to disincentivize error some form of consequence for it because we we know that if we turn on the TV or somebody's watching this national championship match at home, they can't figure out why we would miss a serve. And there's a significant number of coaches that can't figure out why we would want to miss a serve. Like I'll get arguments on that. And and I I get it. So I wish we would I wish we would change the rules a little bit. And I've got some ideas about that. But for right now, the way the game is being played, it's so powerful. And like you said, if you have four or maybe five attackers going against three defenders, if you don't get a team off the net, you're not going to win. And so you have to be able to put pressure on your opponent with your serve or else you just have to be really, really good at defense or really, really good at block. Like there has to be some amazing skill set that you have that counteracts the power of the serve in today's game. Yeah, We've I mean, got is... dialed in pretty well how much – Women's teams are missing. You know, I've written some blog posts and studied the top 25 teams several years to see and kind of land on uh, a lot of these women's teams are missing uh, 
nine, nine and a half, ten percent. As you've looked over the years at your serving stats, is there a number that you like and you no. kind of shoot for that range, or it's just it is what it is in a given year? Dave, I'll be real honest with you. I've never looked at it. I couldn't tell you what we've done over the last five years. I just want our guys to hit it. I want to. I want to hit it. I mean, the truth is, is if you look at our ranks on opponent offense over the last three or four years, I, I like that one. It's a comprehensive stat, right? It tells you a little bit about okay, it's serving, it's block, it's D. How much pressure you're putting on your opponent? We've been at the top or near the top for years. And for me, I just want to uh, listen. I'm going to go in the gym. We're going to train serving. We're going to talk about the fundamentals. We're going to talk about where we want to go. We're going to train it. We put in always talking about what the appropriate volume is. I'm just going to take care of today in the gym. And today in the gym needs to be serving and passing and, and maybe some aspect of system or some part of the game. And I, I'm going to take care of that today. And I have a pretty good idea what that is on a day to day basis. I have a very good idea of what that is on a day-to-day -day basis. And so for me to look over the serves over a number of years and error percentage, I just, I know that that's not really kind of my thing. And, and which is, you know, Skates is watching this right now. He's just like, he's going to call me and he's going to talk to me about how I need to be better about that. You know, because, <laughs> you know, Mike and I obviously both had mentors that were very statistically oriented and that drove a lot of what they were doing. And I certainly take a look at it. I ask my staff, what, what's it telling us? Where do we need to focus? To me, it's about stats that are, are telling you what you need to do in the gym that day. I, I just want to be present that day. Um, and it can shape strategy as you go from season to season, which I think your, your question is, is, is relevant. And I don't, I don't mean to be flippant when I'm saying I, I don't know, Dave. Um, I don't know what that stat is. I just want Ito to be a little bit better. And what does that mean today for him to go there and, and evaluate why he missed in a particular way and, and what was going on within that process? And how did he miss? You know, was it, we all know there's good misses and there's bad misses. And so how do we get at that and, and continue to make our individual players better and better? But from a serving philosophy perspective, I think I've come down to this like almost individualistic perspective on it meaning okay what is ito's role what is ito's skill set what are we asking him to do what is alex knight's role what are we asking him to do what are we helping him train so that he can do this for the team like everybody has a role with their service game it's about identifying what that is um and and having something to go to you know i, I I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about that. Like we would love it if everybody had a good float serve in the men's game. 80% of the guys that show up in my gym at UCLA have never float served in a match. And which we could talk about too. I think that that drives me more nuts than the errors. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I wish that we had more guys that were had a, a more well-rounded game that they could go to some other option if they had it. I mean, I would like to do that. I feel like we spent a fair amount of time trying to, train our athletes at UCLA to be well-rounded volleyball players. Um, but I also feel like that it'd be beneficial if collectively as coaches across the country, we were doing that at younger ages. Yeah. Well, hopefully they're watching and boys volleyball starting up in a lot of States. So we're going to show a map in a few minutes, but, um, yeah. but, uh, that's good to know, um, that, that, uh, we want well-rounded volleyball players. You talked about, uh, serving kind of is the the first line of defense or it's uh, maybe an offense to help set up your defense. Um, so as we look at some defense stats, I mean, more just number one ranks uh, all the way down blocks per sets, opponent hitting percentage. Um, Nick, yeah. as we watch some blocking, just how do you like to coach the, the blocking and it's kind of the front front line of defense? Um, obviously, really good blocking stats here and now you have three blockers that are going against an opponent's five hitters or four hitters, and the game is getting faster and faster and faster. How are you coaching blocking? I've said this for a year. I, I love coaching blocking. It's probably my favorite thing to spend time on. Um, it doesn't always correlate to the most number of points in a match, so it can be challenging to spend too much time there. Um, but for me, there's so much of blocking that's divided into two main categories, the individual motion and hand shaping and placement to get a block when you're in the right spot. And then the system is a team. And so, you know, I think that we have 
incredibly athletic guys. They jump high. They've got great vision. Hopefully they keep their eyes up and they know what they're looking at. Um, and so we spent a lot of time this last year on systems and what we were choosing to do in various situations. And so for me, I, I love taking some of the quiet moments before practice, maybe put some guys up on a box and do some slower technique based stuff. But then once it's live and once you're rolling, it's about going big and, and making big moves and trying to get hands on ball. And, and that's something that I've found over the years. And I had a really awesome conversation with Heather Olmstead about this one time because BYU women's volleyball is typically an incredible blocking team. And she said, Yo, <laughs> we spent an incredible amount of time on it. And so the amount of time that you're spending every single day in your limited practice block that's dedicated to blocking will make you better, but you have to kind of decide where you want to cut that off. Um, and the other thing that I've heard from a coach before is that truly good blocking, like just getting hands on ball is, is something that you recruit more than you train. Some people know how to just reach out and put their hands on the ball, um, which sounds awesome because I was not one of those players at all. <laughs> Uh, I, I felt relatively decently athletic and I just didn't get enough blocks because I didn't know how to put my hand where the ball was going to go. Until later. I mean, I, I, you have to wonder about that, that comment about how it comes into your gym like that, you know, I, yeah. don't, I don't know. I mean, if you look at a guy like uh, right now, we have an outside hitter in our, in our gym called uh, Cooper Robinson. You haven't seen him play very much. Uh, he was a freshman last year, but he's a really exceptional blocker. Like, Maybe the best left side blocker I've seen in a long, long time. Um, and and he, I know he got great training in high school, you know. So I, I think high school and club, I mean, he was really trained in how to shape and how to get into good spots. And I think it, you can see it. So it's trainable. I mean, we've talked about that in terms of motor learning and some of these beliefs about how you can impact athletes. I, I think you can make them better, but it does, you know, it's where you put your focus in the gym. There's a lot of good moves here. My favorites are the ones where they get dug and then quickly get into defensive transition and get a stuff. You know, they don't get <laughs> – oh, look at JR. Yeah, yeah. Look at him. Okay. Oh. <laughs> no, no. It was the best play on the whole video series. Don't worry about it, Dave. <laughs> Goodness sakes. No, I don't even know. I was just – I, I think teasing. it was this one. Don't worry about it. Send me a two <laughs> Send me a two Um. Uh, so after, if the ball gets past your block, then you're digging. Um, John, you talked about being a systems, a, a systems coach. You like systems. What is your defensive system? By the way, this plays awesome. This is the system of just be creative and do something cool. Uh, yeah. um, but, uh, what is your defensive system or is it a combination of many depending on the opponent and yeah. situation? Yeah, I think it's one of those one of those things where you're just trying to figure out the individual tendencies and distribution and, and what are you going to emphasize and focus and are there some things that you're trying to give up i mean i think there's just times when you're giving up something and making decisions about that i think for me it's about just uh from the individual defensive technique i, I do feel like we've been spending a lot of time on, on that and making sure we can get the ball in a position where we can we can set it and, and mike knows this too um Really, I'm a huge set, teach everyone to set kind of guy. So, you know, let's dig that ball in a good spot and let's allow everybody, anybody to go in there and have everybody be skilled enough to set a good ball. And uh, we do spend a lot of time on non setter setter training. Yeah. I mean, Johnny, yeah, I think a lot of good ball control plays here. Yeah. Johnny, I think, uh, you know, one thing specifically about the men's game, like when we came in, or when I came in in 2013, I think there was still this perception that the men's game is too powerful to be effective as a digger, right? Like I always felt like certain guys would use an use it as an excuse. The power mm -hmm. of the game, I can't dig balls, right? And I actually felt like the men's game was behind the women's game in terms of their defensive skill set. 100%. And, and then France came along and, you know, yeah. some of these super gnarly liberos that basically what they did was they, they normalized it and they showed everyone, you know, Hey, at the highest of levels, men in men's volleyball, we can dig a ton of balls. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's, I think, at least in my view, that's been one of the biggest advances in men's volleyball over the last, I don't know, eight years or so is just that, that mentality has shifted. And, mm -hmm. um, and speaking to that, like I know. Hey, go back. So, I mean, this is, 
you got to teach your players how to kick the ball. We train <laughs> kicking every day. Every day you got to make this play. What's the score here? Do we know? It was late in the, in the third set. Yeah. Late in the third set. He kicks this. Just watch this play. We train this every day. Actually, I take it back. We didn't do it today because we're working on some other stuff. I don't want to be, <laughs> be inaccurate. <laughs> oh, yeah, we did train it today. Yes. And boom. That was that was all she wrote right there. So um, I agree with you, Mike. I think it's been a huge advancement in the game, the expectation that you can dig the ball. Some of it is internationally that I think it got to the point with the BIC and with the speed and the power that you weren't going to put your blocker on the ball. And um, if that was the case, then we just have to start figuring out how to dig the ball or it's you're not going to score a point. And so I think there is that emphasis now. You know, and yep. The guys so, are getting better at it. Yep. So if you're a high school coach starting to coach boys volleyball, you got to work on digging just like you did in the women's game. You got to teach those guys uh-huh. the same skills, same yep. mechanics, same movement patterns. And uh, I think it's really important. I agree. Totally agree. Hey, John, I hope I'm not going to give a trade secret away here, but uh, I want you to walk us through this play. Number seven is your setter, mm-hmm. and he's going to play middle back right now. Yeah. And um, this is this is creative. <laughs> uh, yeah. Walk us through this and kind of the genesis of it and and how you practice it when you decide to implement this. Um, well, uh, I guess you just have to be open-minded to stick in your best digger where the ball is going to go. <laughs> you know, it's just, and what do you need to do? And, and I'm not the first one to do something like that. I mean, I've seen it done before. I mean, even Brazil years ago would have Sergio go play over there. And um, so I just was thinking about, okay, here's tendencies. Here's a, a likelihood of a ball going to a particular place. What do we need to do? And, and the truth is, is Roan coming out of area six to set the ball is not hard. I think it'd actually be a little bit harder maybe coming from five if, if he was turned the other direction. But when he's coming out of six, it's just not – he's able to square up just like he normally is and put the ball wherever he wants. So that allowed us to maybe stick Gooch into area one a couple times. See? No problem. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It, Perfect. It, it's, it's probabilities are taking a chance. You know, you're just trying to find a way to score one point and, and does this do that or not? I mean, on that play, it didn't do anything, right? Gooch didn't get the dig, but yeah. it was in a position where Rowan could set from six. So we did practice that a little bit. Um, that wasn't totally out of the blue in this match. That was something that we had prepped for. Just pull it out in the national championship. I love it. <laughs> There's no better time. <laughs> There's hey, uh, next day. <laughs> for our last couple of minutes here, John, I want to show you this map that I put together yesterday. I got some info from NFHS and um, we're at 25 states now mm-hmm. uh, with sanctioned boys volleyball. Yep. A lot of those states are starting this year for the first time. So uh, Utah, we're 89 days away from the first boys high school volleyball match. And a lot of these coaches are... Um, our girls coaches maybe going to boys volleyball because the principal asked them or athletic director asked them what what can coaches take from the girls game to high school boys volleyball and then maybe vice versa also how can how can the two how can the two games come together to make a better game uh that's a good question i i think resources is number one i think if you're talking about growth at the high school level you have the gym you have the net you got the balls you just need to have a willing ad or willing leadership and honestly advocates that are local advocates are really really impactful and then we we can support you in doing that which is why i think you've seen such remarkable growth in the last year i mean was it nine states in the last year and i I think that's hope we're hoping it's a little bit of a tipping point um it started in Colorado with uh, a, a man by the name of Scott Siegfried, who was a superintendent and understood the process of how you get sports sanctioned in a particular state. His son was playing, young son was playing volleyball. He wanted him to have the ability to play. So we had a local advocate and somebody with some real knowledge. And so when he did that, we, we had him join the board of First Point and picked his brain about how to do that and then put together a lot of documents and started sharing it. Um, we literally just got the ability to share it. We just wanted to get it out there. Um, 
We just got a Slack account. Okay, here's the bylaws. Here's how you do this. This is what you do. And, and we're here to help. And then another board member, member Kenny Rogers, had this idea about um, let's actually hire volunteers to be advocates. Let's let's put the word out that this is what we're trying to do. And I, I think it's been hugely successful. And so we can now provide resources and a roadmap for how you can get your leadership within a particular state to sanction the sport. And in some cases that predated first point, I think that the people in Ohio and other states have been trying for a long time, but now we have a high school committee and we have representatives, I think now from all 50 states and we get together every few months and we talk about what's going on and how we're doing and we network and we start talking about how we can do that. And I think what you're starting to get now is this like, Hey, they did it here, here, and here. So let's do it here. And some states are 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 seeing that. There's some, oh, it's being done in Minnesota. It's being done in Utah. Okay, let's let's take a look at this and maybe Texas or maybe some other states that are coming online. And so I, I'm really excited about it. I think it's been a remarkable effort by the board at first point. I'm really excited about it. It might combined with a few of the the schools that we've added the SIAC grant to start the historical black colleges uh, was really monumental I think for us in the sport um, we just got two division ones in the last several weeks so I, I think the first point is really making a difference but I think this is one of our big wins I think that for us to have an impact on on high school sanctioning is going to have really nice growth for us at this level our goal is to get to a hundred thousand boys playing the game by 2028, the Olympics at 2028. I think that's an attainable goal. I think we're on the right path. Awesome. Uh, John, Nick, do you have just a minute for some rapid fire questions? Let's do it. Absolutely. Okay. Nick's ready. All right, John, I know you've been asked this question a lot because I've heard people ask you this question, but Nick, you can take it if you want because maybe you haven't been asked it a ton. Uh, let's skip the first part and just say, do you think we can get to a point in the women's game where the BIC is a statistically accepted play to run consistently? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the highest levels right now, you're seeing it more and more, and it tends to rely on one singular player that is very athletic to just go up and hit the hell out of the ball. Um, but I think that you can make it incredibly effective. It just might look a little bit different for certain players or certain programs, but the ability to just ram offense down the middle of the court is super effective just for what it does to the block on the other side. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I want to see more and more of it with the understanding that it's not always going to be your biggest bounce kill, but it's going to be effective. Okay, Coach Artie, back to practice kicking every day. How much time are you spending doing stuff like that? Five minutes would definitely be enough. I think it's in introducing the skill, and then it's just a, it's one or two minutes a day, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. There was a, a phrase that I used that I stole from an article. I think it was in Sports Illustrated. Um, might have been ESPN talking about Odell Beckham when he caught that ball like backhanded and uh, they thought this was some remarkable play and he said no I actually train that every single day I get you know five or six throws in the back of the end zone and I work on grabbing that and there's a term for it, it's called high leverage so these are high leverage plays so we spend we don't do them all every day but we do a little bit of high leverage training every single day okay you had two losses in 2023 one of them was to hawaii then you're facing hawaii in the national championship match and you can be as uh, as open or as secretive with this answer as you want to be but what was the game plan going into that one and what in match adjustments did you make we got this question a couple days ago well the in match adjustment was putting in jr i mean that was that was just personnel based and and knowing he had the capacity to put more service pressure and offensive pressure there Maybe a little less blocking, but a little bit more of this. So I, that was a piece you know, off the bench that um, I had, and I knew he'd be good there. I really had a lot of trust in that move. That was not that was not with a big deep breath or anything. I knew we we had that, and I, I went to it and knowing it would work. Um, of course, he really stepped up and had an amazing match. Um, going into Hawaii, I mean, I, I guess it's just you learn a little bit when you play teams, and okay, this is what we got to do against this player, and. I don't know. I mean, we were really close when we played him in Hawaii. You know, I think we were we were right there in in those sets that we lost, and so I think it was a a little bit. Oh, yeah, we know we knew that team, and and 
knew a little bit about their individual tendencies. I don't think there's anything like landmark there about what we were doing, but I, I do think the JR sub was huge. Okay, we'll finish on this one. What are your thoughts on a real men's professional league in the U.S.? The women have three highly sponsored leagues now. Men are struggling with two amateur leagues without any real money. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Um, every once in a while, someone has a, a, a proposal about what it could be. I think our best opportunity is honestly if one, if one or two of these leagues on the women's side have get some real traction and really start growing and uh, having some real success. And if they'd be interested in, in adding men to their league, I think that's probably our best option at this point. So I'm, I'm cheering them on. I mean, for the growth of the sport, not just because we hope to have a pro league someday, but I think you're starting to see great television exposure on the women's side. That's great for the entire sport. It's great for men's volleyball. I, I think our best opportunity right now on the men's side is to, uh, cheer on the women and, and hope that they continue to sell out arenas and they're going to be on network TV for the national championship game. And I think all of this is great. And you're seeing great growth in boys volleyball. So if we can continue on this trajectory four or five, 10 years from now, I think the sport collectively can be in a great place. Yeah, I think I can make that same map that we looked at a few minutes ago in two or three years from now, there's going to be a lot more yellow on that map, which is awesome to see. Um, John, you got about 10 more seconds to type in hashtag GMS plus into our YouTube channel. If you, uh, if you want to enter or we can just send you one and Nick one. Um, but everyone out there, go ahead and, uh, enter GMS plus. We're going to do a drawing here in about uh, five more seconds. So. Paul, when you see this, uh, throw up there, you can click that draw button. And if your name pops up here, uh, just send us an email at info at goldmedalsquared.com. That's uh, info at goldmedalsquared.com and let us know that uh, you won the Stanley Cup and we'll send it out to you. You got a couple so Paul, of late entries right there. Went from 16 to 18. 19. <laughs> Give it a second, Paul. Give it a second. Someone else is doing it desperately. Mike's looking down at his phone. He's probably trying to get it. <laughs> We had, 20. Mike's, Mike just we got had in several hundred viewers, uh, several hundred people watch this show. 25. Hold on. Okay, hold here on. we go. Getting, people are getting <laughs> fired up. Uh, Paul, wait. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> and the winner is Axel Hernandez. So, Axel, right. go ahead and send us a, a email info at goldmedalsquared.com. Um, John and Nick, thank you so much. Awesome having you for our 50th live show. Uh, just awesome hearing your insight. This was the first live show we've done with men's coaches. Uh, I hope to do many more, but just getting a di different perspective and different insight uh, statistically on a lot of these things was super helpful and super awesome. Well, Dave, thanks. Obviously, you put a lot of effort into this, and uh, I appreciate being on here. And uh... Great seeing you. I appreciate what you guys are doing for the game. I know you've been doing a lot to help develop coaches, and we know that good coaches make a difference in the lives of young people. So we're all doing great work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having us on, and the graphics and the videos were awesome. Thanks so much for that. All right. Go Bruins. Go Bruins. Oh, gosh, that yeah. sounds Go good. Go Bruins Vancouver. in 2024, so and, then, uh, and then good luck in Paris. Uh, you're heading out to Paris after the 2024 season. So uh, good luck, John and Nick, over the next uh, – the next several months and then throughout the summer we'll be rooting you on from here and and uh, wishing the best for all of you everyone else out there once again uh, remember visit goldmedalsquared.com for info about clinics info about camps uh if you want to watch those 49 other live shows go ahead and check out uh, gms plus just a wealth of knowledge in there uh thank you for investing in your coaching and in your program thank you once again john and nick We'll talk to you all again for our next live show. We'll keep you posted and have a good one, everybody.